Yes, the, the ship went in commission, I believe it was the 9th of October. And I went on sometime, probably around the 10th or 15th. We were still in the shipyard at Alameda. And uh, it was welders all over it. Uh, the biggest thing we did was hold a fire extinguisher while somebody was welding. They, they wasn't actually, it was adding light clips to hold, uh, clips of ammunition, uh, clips to, to hold life rafts, that type of welding. It wasn't actually a big construction job. Mm -hmm. And every two or three days we'd take a trip up and down to San Francisco Bay. And I don't know, sometime the last of October, I guess, or the first of November, we started a shakedown cruise, which was from San Francisco to San Diego. The first day out, uh, it might be a tradition from what I've heard, uh, we got greasy pork chops with gravy and mashed potatoes, the, the whole works, and about 30 minutes later, about 90% of the crew was hanging up with the rifle. <laughs> Uh, the ground swells <laughs> off of Frisco are, are pretty, pretty big, and this, this ship rode like a roller coaster even when it uh, was kind of smooth. <laughs> I, I was seasick for, I don't know, it seems like three, four, five days. <laughs> we had a motor whale boat, it's about a 30 foot boat that uh, had a partial cover over the front of it with this uh, upholstery cushions and it. I had got up in there, <laughs> supposed to be standing watch up on the flying bridge. And they found me down there and a guy by the name of Botwell taking me up and he says, you know, someone in wartime when you don't show up for watch, they can shoot you. And I said, just take me back to the fan table and shoot me, Botwell. <laughs> <laughs> with kind of the way I felt about it. As sick as you were, you'd, you'd welcomed it. <laughs> well, you know, you're not really sick until everything's gone and you vomit up the green vinyl and when that's gone, you get the dry heaves and you just kind of rock on your heels. <laughs> but I got over that and I was okay after that. Occasionally I'd get a little queasy going out, but uh, never really got seasick again. The San Diego, we had some more repair work done. Of course, we tested all the guns, uh, depth charges, decay guns, and they had us done practice sweeping. And sometime about the middle of November, we started for Pearl Harbor. We got to Pearl the sometime, I guess we left in December. We eat Christmas dinner, I think, on the way over. The first night in Pearl, we had uh, an air raid alarm. We had one guy that was in the shower when the collection went off and he was up on the flying bridge at the gun station. The only thing he had on when he got up there was his life belt. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, scared us all to death. I, I don't know what, what it was, but they liked that the whole deal. And Pearl Harbor was actually bombed another time from flying boats that, that you don't hear about. No, I never heard that. Yeah. They, they refueled them at, uh, I believe, at the French frigate Fault Shoals by a sub, and they flew overnight and bombed the Pineapple, pineapple Field. Mm. We operated out of Pearl on uh, submarine patrol and uh, exercises of the sweep gear and all in and out of port. And about the middle of January, we started uh, for the Marshall invasion of Kwajalein. And we went in at Roy Island, <laughs> a little island about a mile and a half long and a half mile wide. There was two of them. At high tide, there was uh, water over a little neck of land. At low tide, they walked from one island to the other. 
and if we swept through a straight between uh, just a little island up on the port side, on the starboard side, and I figured we'd be swimming before the day was over. We got up, uh, well, on D-Day minus one for the supper meal, we got two fried eggs, or two eggs cooked any way we wanted them in a pork shop with the trimmings. And the next morning, at about daybreak, we had, uh, most of us were up, they were just shelling uh, the island. The 16 inch shells going over, and that sounded like a freight train going over, and you can actually see them in flight if they're going over like this. Now, were they coming from battleships? Yeah. The battleships was then behind the shell for cover. And as we went through the strait, there was a Jap gunner fired two or three rounds at about well, hit two or three hundred yards in front of us. And it was a dive bomber up over us and a destroyer over on our port side. The destroyer put out five guns out of the dive bomber went into the dive and dropped the bomb and I think all five shells and the bomb hit the same spot. That, that was the only, that was the only return fire I saw the whole, whole time on that invasion. <laughs> they had uh, a bombing raid that, that night, which I slept through. They had to come down and wake me up. The last one I ever slept through. <laughs> Now this would have been early 1944, right? January 44? Yeah. February. February. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We were on the ground the first night and tore the sound gear off. And we, we swept all around the Roy and the Atoll there and swept the channel to Kwajalein. Uh, Roy Island is secured in about a day and a half. Quadrant, I, I forgot, took three or four days on it. And uh, then we had patrol duty outside of the Atoll. Uh, Explain how a minesweeper works. Yeah. Well, you've got uh, two big winches on the stern of the ship, and you've got a float that looks like a uh, it looks like a drop tank for an airplane in World War II. It's their torpedo shaped. And the float was uh, about 10 feet long and maybe 30 inches in diameter. It had a little flag on it. And you had a wire cable that went out through some pulleys on the stern of the ship. And we had what we called two, a kite and a depressor. It was a big square deal that had veins on it set at an angle, and one of them took the cable down, and the other one took the cable out at an angle, and the float told us where, where the cable was at, and the cable had cutters on it. And theoretically, you're outside the mine field, and when the mine hits the cable, it runs, runs down and hits the cutter, and then it comes up and floats. And on the return trip, then you, you sink them with the gunfire to explode them. Uh, the mines are set, uh, they are on a little car like it's uh, oh, maybe four feet square. It's got a winch on it with a wire cable. And it sinks to the bottom, and then they got a wafer in there that. Uh, Dissolves and it releases the winch, and then the mine comes up to a preset depth. Still attached to a cable. It's attached to a cable. Yeah. And that cable is what your sweeper would catch. Yeah. We, we catch the cable, then it runs down our sweeper wire and hits the cutter. And when it comes up, it will come up and float. Mm -hmm. And then you can explode it. Yep. Yeah. The theory was that. Uh, you just hit them with rifle fire and put a hole in the casing and it'll flood it and it'll sink. But uh, we never did have one do that. We got a hold of one mine at Saipan and uh, they thought it had a chain on it. We got it hung in the gear and uh, 
we pulled it up within about four feet of the back of the ship. I had we had just come off when when you're sweeping your general quarters. And we had just come off the general quarters and I'd laid down to try to catch a couple of winks before I went on watch. And everybody come running up the deck headed for the balcony, hollering mine, mine, mine. And I went up on the old one level and walked to the back and could look over. And it's back there bobbing like a cork you know, within 10 feet of the back of the ship. And somebody got his nerve back and went back and let the brake off on the winch. And of course it drifts out. And we finally shook it loose. And after that we went into an explosive cutter. When the cutter had a trigger on it with an explosive charge, it would cut the cable. But uh, it took longer because you had to restrict Retrieve the cable after all your cutters were gone and, and then re reload them. What, what uh, if you're going through a minefield, what's to keep the ship that's pulling these cables from detonating? You, you're supposed to be outside of it. Oh. Well, did they have flags up telling you where it was <laughs> no. so you could avoid it? No. <laughs> I guess we started at, uh, they could see some of it, I think, from the air. And uh, I, I never did figure that out. You had three types of mines. You had the, the uh, horn type, that's the type that was anchored that I'm talking about. They had uh, horns on that horn was made out of lead with a glass tube of acid in it. When you break the horn, it breaks the glass, it runs down and charges the batter, which sets it off. Mm. And it's nearly instantaneous. And these mines weighed somewhere around five, six hundred pounds TNT in them. The, uh, then you had an acoustic mine that the Germans had. We didn't run across any of them while I was on the ship that was set up by the propeller noises. And then you had a magnetic mine that was set up by the, the effect of the ship going over. And we went through what they call degaussing. They put big cables around the ship, and when they degaussed it, they supposedly lined the magnetic field to where it was all parallel. Instead of the magnetic, the, the metal in the ship, instead of being like jack straws, they lined up the magnetic field where everything was in the north and south direction. So supposedly, we could go over a mine, a magnetic mine. And we had a big, what we called a decausing cable, it was about three or four inches in diameter that trailed out behind the stern of the ship. And then we had a big generator that run a magnetic field through that, that we would sweep for magnetic mines. And the acoustic ones, we had a big, uh, something down in the bowels of the ship that it sounded like somebody with about a 20 pound sledgehammer beating on an oil drum at about 10 feet in diameter. And we had another one of those that we put over the side with a, with a, uh, a crane that uh, we would put down in the water. So that would make noise yeah, and fool the mine into exploding yep. before the propeller noise. Yep. Well, now that first mine you talked about, the one with the grass, the glass on it, even a wooden ship would set that it, off and hit it, would it? Anything that hit it. I mean, if a swimmer was swimming and hit it and bent that horn, uh, yeah. it was gone. Is that the spiky mines you see with a bunch of spikes? Yeah, that's, so that's what the reason they yeah, have that. Yeah, okay. yeah. I never had any clue about that. I always, I don't know. There was another one. They had, had a floating antenna on it. Uh, I never saw one. I've seen pictures of it. But it, the, the exploding device was on a cable that floated down here and it would go around in the circles. These, uh, these contact mines, that's the ones with the horn on the contact, were planted in, in the fields around harbors. Uh, we had them in all the the harbors around the states in Pearl Harbor, you had to go in a certain way. The, uh, 
the mine sweep the slogan was where the fleet goes, we have been. <laughs> the, the, the first ship in the Tokyo Bay after the war was a minesweeper. That makes sense. The the ward was an old World War four four piper that had been converted to the mine standing to a to a fa fast minesweeper. They they fired the first shots in World War Two. The, the Navy fired and sunk the first jet submarine. It was coming into the harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about the destroyer doing it. It was an old four piper destroyer converted to a mine sweeper. They were supposed to be high speed, but from what I've talked to on some of the men that was on them, they they were on their last legs. The we had uh, we had some some new destroyers later in the war converted to mine sweepers and we had a wooden mine sweeper that we called a yard sweep that looked like a tuna boat. They, they were wood and uh, there was a bunch of them all up and down the west coast and there was a bunch of them in Pearl. I never saw any of them out in the islands. We had some sub chasers out there that was a smaller, smaller than uh, the mines was then uh, the yard sweepers. And we even had some Higgins boats before we left Saipan. You know what I'm talking about on a Higgins boat mm -hmm. that was rigged up for sweeping right in, right in at the shoreline. How, how much damage would a mine do if it hit a ship? Well, <coughs> of course it depends on where it hit it, wouldn't it? It bred on, on a mine sweeper. A lot of them that were hit mid-ship, they broke them in two. Uh, you take 500 pounds of TNT going off under the bottom of it, uh, they, well, in Korea, the two destroyers, some destroyers got into some minefields over there and got beat up bad. It, it could do a tremendous amount. A lot of the mountain sweepers, it was the sunk one down just a matter of minutes. Your, your subs, your subs were your, supposedly your most dangerous part of the Navy. And then your your air come next, and then mine sweeping come next. Now what did you say was second? Air. The, the carriers? No, not the carriers, the I, pilots. Oh, the pilots, yeah, yeah. That night was saying, uh, yeah, I, I was misunderstanding. I understand what you're saying. You're good. I just yeah. want to make sure. The, we had a fire at sea. We had a movie projector. We showed movies every night in the mess hall. And of course, it was a just one projector, and you had to change the reel. The kid that was running the projector, when we turned the lights on, everybody smoked, of course. He drops the cigarette butt down in a can of film, and that was when the film was celluloid. Yeah. And it went off, it wasn't but two ways out. One of them was by the projector where the fire was, the other one was out on the end where we was at. And the guy was excited trying to push the door open and it had, was dogged down with six dogs on it. If you know what you're talking on a dog, what we called a dog was a latch that come down at the top in the middle and at the bottom it had a rubber gasket on it made it water tight. Another guy and I fought our way up there and got the hatch open and went all got out. I grabbed the fire hose and had it on. You got the fire knocked down, the electrician screaming about the water on their electrical stuff. So we dropped the fire, turned the fire hose off and left. And I went up on the top, top level then. And we had uh, a 20 millimeter locker up there full of ammunition. And they were spraying water all over the deck up there. I took my shoes off and it was hot. I couldn't really walk on the deck. And we had, you know, probably 40 or 50,000 rounds of ammunition in a ready service locker up there. Run the mercury out of both thermometers. On your magazines and ammunition, you have to take temperature readings every day. The low and the high one, and the mercury gone up the top of both of them broken. 
What, any, were there any casualties as a result of the fire? No. We, I was on, on this ship for a little over a year, and we had some, some accidents, like a guy cutting himself with a knife, or one kid got his foot hung up in a, a rope once when we were landing and jerked a knot in his leg and didn't break it, but you know, that type of accident. Somebody falling down the ladder or something, but uh, no casualties of that type. And then we graduated there and got our wings, and then of course I came back by here, Christmas was coming up. I came, we came back. They was about 350 graduators at one time up there, all pilots, all, all uh, twin engine pilots. And then we came back home here, and then the first of the year, that was the first of 1945, we, were, we went to uh, Sebring, Florida, and took transition training, they called it, in B-17, four-engine B-17 training. And then by the time we got through with the B-17 training, the war in Europe was slowing down some, you know. And, uh, and, and by that time, they had quite a few pilots during the training periods. And as a matter of fact, they had a pool of them. But anyway, we, we were taken out of the B-17 training program and put in the B-29 training program. And I flew as a co-pilot on a B-29 and got a crew together. There was 11 men in the crew. And we went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and picked up a brand new B-29. And uh, the thing, thing even smell like a new car. <laughs> it was brand new. And we flew it down to Clovis, New Mexico. Clovis, New Mexico was a combat training base for B-29 crews. It's what it was, a tremendous place. I mean, it was out on and hot as it could be, out on that desert, no trees, no, no mountains to bother you, nothing. And they had about a six or seven thousand foot runway, which was a well, it's five thousand feet in a mile. I think it was over a mile long. And uh, so we started taking training there. We got eleven man crew, got our airplane, and then uh, we took off. We had a training mission. The last training mission we had there was to go to Fort Worth, Texas and fly over Meacham Field in Fort Worth, Texas at 15,000 feet and do five radar control night bomb runs. <clears throat> the reason for that was what they were doing is leaving Saipan and flying to Tokyo and back. Well, that was about a 3,000 mile trip a very difficult trip to make and it got to where they couldn't they couldn't fly in formation you know nine airplanes in formation mm -hmm. like this because it was just too hard on your nerves to do it and so they made the decision to let you just take off from Saipan you and your flight how many of you are and go straight to the target by yourself just go straight to the target by yourself you didn't have to fly formation and by that time, they didn't have very much. I got all this information from the instructors that were instructing us that had already been over there. Right. And they just went in instead of a formation. Maybe they'd come from Kwajalein, 50 of them, and 25 in Saipan, and 25 in Tinian, and head for Tokyo. And uh, there was radio, there was no radio contract, uh, contact. And particularly if there's bad weather, you couldn't fly a formation. It's too dangerous getting that close together. They just trailed each other. They just went in there and trailed. And uh, I had a letter here. I've got a letter here from Billy Reese that was on one of those missions. And they just went in on radar and just one right after the other. Just one, say 150 airplanes, just one right after the other. By that time, had the Japanese Air Force been weakened? To they had severely weakened by that time. It, they got to the point that the Japanese Air Force, in other words, if you went in, say, with 20 or 30 airplanes, here they all came up there and we had a big fight. If you went in one at a time, they didn't want to get up there and waste fuel with 25 airplanes with one airplane. It worked out better. But th th those instructors told us that people th th they finally got the Japanese where they just didn't want to have anything to do with the B-29 as far as fighters go. 
because the thing had 13 50 caliber uh, machine guns on it, and they were all calibrated so that this central gun controller up here with his bomb sight, he could control all 13 of them by himself, or he could switch it and give you one and switch it and give him two. And, and, them, and them fighters coming in there, it was just a solid spray of 50 caliber machine guns. They just shoot them down one right after the other. And uh, when they first went over there, the instructors told us that they, they, they scared everybody to death. They said that the Japanese had a fighter plane and the wings were reinforced with steel across the front. And what they would do is just knock the tail off the 29. See, if they knocked the tail off the 29, that's all they had to do because there's no way to fly. You're gone. Everybody's killed. They had everybody scared to death of that thing. And they said, when one of them Japanese <laughs> things hit it, told you they opened up. They, they threw everything they had at That's pretty amazing. But uh, <laughs> it was interesting to hear them tell about those things. But it was amazing to me that they just went in and trailed. And then as they went in on the target, then they were on their own, on their own, on the way home. And our airplane had a big C right on the tail. A lot of them had an A. And that was your squadron. If you if you headed home and you saw somebody, there's no radio contract, it's all silent. You saw him with a big C, you would know he's going to Saipan. And you'd kick his go stay with him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but there on the last they had they had a lot of trouble with getting back. They they took Iwo Jima. And they were landing B-29s at Iwo Jima on the way back from Tokyo out of gas, practically out of gas. Some of them landed with one motor on them running out of gas. And they were fighting up in the mountains. The Marines were fighting up the mountains, and they had to have that Iwo Jima to, in case they couldn't get back home, so they have some place to land. And, and they just land them in there and refuel them and crew to lay down some tents and sleep a little while. It, but it was, it was interesting to hear them uh, talk about that. But, but that night, the reason I said that, the, our training period that night, we left Clover New Mexico, that's what we were supposed to do, is use radar on Beecham Field and make those runs. And there was three of us took off, and one, one behind the other. The first one took off about two minutes later the next one, about two minutes later the next one. And then we formed up, and then they had two fighter planes on the east side, P-47s, to escort us. In effect, we were heading for the target, really is what it amounted to. And then about halfway out, them 247 dropped off and went back home. But when we got close to Meacham Field, we got in that trail position. Those two B-29s got behind us. We were in front. And we went down and flew what they call a box pattern and came back up over Meacham Field. And down on the ground, they had a little thing down there when you drop your bonds, you'd pin like that and make a little mark on them. And they'd mail that to your commander so to show you how you did on that thing. We made one of those runs and then start to turn, level out to make another one. And that's when this other airplane hit us. It hit on the right hand side. <coughs> it was tremendous crash, hit on the right hand side and took number four engine and the rest of the wing off. We were at 15,000 feet. <coughs> and on the way over there, our airplane, something was wrong, there's something always wrong with that thing. It, it, it would lose, it'd go down about 200 feet. The automatic pilot let it go down about 200 feet and then it'd catch it, raise it back up, but it wouldn't stop that right on 15,000, it'd go about 200 above it. And there's a little control down here where you can override. And I'd override it when it started up and the bombardier would holler and get this thing on <laughs> 15,000 feet. And so in order that I could see better, it was at night, of course they have fluorescent light. I undid my seat belt, and it's lucky I did because it saved my life. I know. So I undid it. You wasn't supposed to do that. You're supposed to keep that buckle all the time. So I could lean forward and get a little bit closer to the instruments and could see better. And when that other airplane hit us, of course, it knocked me all over the place. And I finally pulled myself down and got together 
and uh, what happened, these, the number one and two were still running, number three was still running, number four engine was gone. I could see it wasn't there, the wing wasn't there. And the only way out of the darn thing, there's a co-pilot's wing on the right side, and the pilot's wing on the left side. And that's all there is because the thing is, uh, there's a, there's a co-pilot's one right here, pilot's one, and another one on the other side just like it. You know, none of these windows open right here. See, that thing's pressurized just like an airliner. You can sit up there in your shirt sleeves at 20,000 feet, it's comfortable. And so, but the only way out of it was through that window. And of course, you never go out that window unless you, you're barely laying on the ground to prop to stop. Because you go right back in number three engine if you went out there. But in that particular age, there's no other way to get out of the thing. And I opened the window. I didn't have it. It's got a rod. It breaks it. It slides up. And nothing wasn't in trouble to open. I guess it done depressurized itself when that wing tore up. And I crawled up there. And, and then when I looked out, of course, it was all on fire. It was lit up. It was light. You could see pieces flying and tremendous amount of noise. See, those engines were still running. I couldn't get a hold of the throttles to pull them back. And it was just so much noise, just tremendous noise. And I looked out and I knew through number three was right behind, so I couldn't go out. So I just, I defined this, I don't know I could do, just get back in and forget it. And because uh, it was, you know, just all over. I mean, you, you know, just that's death. You just face it. There's no way out of it. And of course, you pray, you know, for forgiveness of your sins and that sort of thing. And that's what I did. Then the next thing happened. <clears throat> I felt, I felt a, something hit my right side over here. And what had happened, I was sunk, I was sticking out of that window like that up to my legs here and that slipstream on my back had just pushed me down that air. I guess the thing going six, seven hundred miles an hour and that wind pushed me down and I was trying to raise up to get back in, this is what I figured out later. And that rip cord is right there. And I think what I did when I raised up like that, I hung my thumb in that rip cord. And when I raised up, you only had to pull it about that far. It's got a cable goes around the back, pulls out. And and that thing pulled out when I hung, I didn't intentionally do it, of course. But when I pulled that thing out, that chute opened. And it yanked me out of that window, and as I as I went out, instead of going into the prop, that thing, these two engines over here had pulled it up like that, and they were just in a flat spin, the power on spin, spinning down, and this thing was pulling me up, and the chute pulled me out over that number three and hit the front of the chute to cut the front of the chute off. But then as I went out, the tail of that thing came around and hit me on the right side. <clears throat> the tail of the plane? The tail of the airplane, and when it, when it hit me on the right side, it knocked me unconscious. And uh, <clears throat> then the next thing I knew, everything was real quiet. I mean, it's just quiet as a pin. And, and I was just about half conscious and about half unconscious and I thought, well, you know, I'm dead. This is eternity. I'm just dead. And for some reason or other, I felt air blowing over my legs. And I, and I kind of looked down and kind of shook my head and came to myself a little bit. And I, I knew the risers were still up here. And I looked up and there was that white chute open. Well, I didn't, I didn't remember. Well, but before that, I knew the sheep, I hadn't pulled the rip cord, and I pulled it, pulled the rest of it out and threw it down with this arm and my shoulder way off down here, <coughs> and there was no shock. And I didn't think to look up, you know. I just, I got reached back there trying to tear it open, which was foolish, I couldn't have torn it open anyway, and it was open all the time. <laughs> and then uh, when I kind of got myself straightened up, I was, I was slumped down in the chute, like a dead person, just slumped down in there. And I reached up trying to pull up, and this arm, of course, I don't know whether it pulled it or not, but I felt the chute crimp, you know, spilt air out of it, and I turned it loose real quick. 
And then, of course, it was dark, I couldn't see anything. And I hit the ground and knocked me unconscious again. And but when, I, when I regained consciousness the second time, that chute just went right out in front, laid right down in front. There was no wind. Didn't drag you? No, if it had been any wind, it drug me to death. And that, that chute just folded right down in front, and over here to the left in the tree line was an airplane. You know, all that magnesium, that white burning magnesium. And it was over on that side. And then um, it wasn't long after that till I heard somebody holler, there was a doctor. And he came out there. And, and that parachute had a little kit, first aid kit on it. It tied on to the riser. He took that thing off. <coughs> had two little old morphine shreds about that long. You've seen them, a little morphine, and gave me those. And he reset my arm there on the ground. And it was blue over there for a long time. He said, I'm going to reset it before, it's, before it gets cold. But I didn't know it at that time and didn't know it until about 20 or 30 years later. Uh, I had trouble with my spine. And I went out to get a doctor ready. Now, see, I was laying on the ground. He put that back and put it in a sling. And they took me directly to the hospital in Mineral Wells, Texas. Well, we didn't get up there until 2.30 in the morning, and the technician was gone. That was on Friday night. And they couldn't take the x-rays till the next morning. And uh, when, But what happened when they, they, since that was in a sling, that's all they did to it. My shoulder was broken. And uh, they took x-rays, my leg was broken, foot, and a bunch of other stuff. But I went out to Reddy about 20, 30 years later, and he, he said, how did you break your shoulder? I said, your shoulder's been broken. And said, nature has healed it back. I said, it's got a big place on it where gristle is formed on it. I said, it's formed itself back. I thought, well, I'll be darned. I knew what happened right then when he said that, I knew. They never did check it the next morning. I went to x-ray and got the x-ray, but they never did check my shoulder. So, what about the rest of the the crews? Well, you would think you would think that my escape was miraculous, and it was. I don't doubt that. But back in the back, this early Wishmeyer right here, I'll give you this for you. Okay. He was a gunner back there, and he was set up in that central gun control area without, and you couldn't get up in there with a shoot on. Now the crew had chest type shoots with two big hooks on them. So he took that off and had it laid there so he could get up in there. <coughs> when that happened, he finally grabbed that chute and buckled it on himself. And there's a big blister about that big on the side. Well, you can see it right there on the side. I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. Great big blister. Of course, you couldn't knock it out with a sledgehammer because it's pressurized. No way you could knock a thing out. But when this, when this gas and, and was all burning back there, it, it weakened that blister. It distorted that blister. And right in that blister was this remote gun control site mounted on a aluminum base about there with four bolts in it. Just stick it up on that base. And he put his back against something and kicked that gun site and it knocked that darn blister out of there. It knocked that blister out. And when it did, he stuck his, his feet went out when he did that, and his legs were both burned on this side. See where that gas leak was on burned? And he pulled his legs back in and went out head first. And he just barely pulled the chute and landed in the tree out there, broke his leg. But he walked about a half mile to get to a farmhouse. But that was a miraculous thing that he did. I mean, it just, un it just unbelievable. It just wouldn't happen. Uh, and, uh, but we were very lucky. Well, anyway, that went on, and this past October of 2003, the, it happened over a little town west of Fort Worth called Weatherford, Texas. Just a small little town, about like Cave City at one time. And it uh, happened right next, right close to the town. Right, if it happened today, it'd be right downtown. <clears throat> The Historical Society got together and they felt like that they need to put up a monument to those 18 that got killed. Now we had 11, a crew of 11, nine of ours got killed. The other airplane went about a mile and a half before it hit the ground. Of course it killed all of them too, they were all killed. They killed 18 people. And uh, 
but Wishmeyer is still living out, and he's living out in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's about 84, 85 years old right now. But we went down there. They called and said, if you'll come down here, we'll pay you fare and everything, all your expenses. And said, Wishmeyer's going to be here, and said, I want you to be down here. So I got my nephew to go with me, and we went down there on that day. And it was, it was an unusual, unusual thing to see. <clears throat> Nobody knew how many people were going to be there. But I went down and talked to a lot of these people. I'll give you some stuff, Jesse, to take with you. Uh, yeah, David, of, David will want to get some. He'll, he'll get some one music. of these things was this letter right here from this Mr. Lowell Sullivan, Jr. He was 12 years old. He was out in his daddy's car, him and some of his buddies, driving illegally, no <laughs> license, too young to drive. And this airplane went down close to where they were. And they drove on to where it was. And some of the boys, they, they had, had tried to get out some way or other. They were on fire, burning and all. And it says in here they took sand and threw on them, you know, trying to, trying to, do, but it killed all of them. And he wrote this, and, and I met him down there, and he gave this to me. And I'll give, I'll give it. And yeah, David will take a picture of that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give it to you. you. I'll give that to you. Yeah, if you can let me borrow some. I'll get, I got a bunch of stuff I can give you right here. Cool. But after that, I stayed in the hospital for all from, well, that was August 17th to September 23rd, I think, and then came back home. I wanted to stay in there. I wanted to make a career out of the military, but it didn't work out that way. And then by the time you got well enough, the war was over, wasn't it? war was over, yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so then, of course, my football scholarship had gone, too, because I couldn't play football then. But uh, anyway, they had the GI Bill of Rights that came, came along about that time. Gave everybody free college education. I don't know how the world of government could afford to do that back then, but with all the expense of that four-year war, but it was the best, one of the best investments America that's, ever made. That's right. It was absolutely without absolutely. a question. Yes. You know, educated all those folks, and, and my goodness, after the sacrifices most of them had made, it was worth it. That, that was... Well, uh, after I got over at Camp Brackenridge, uh, uh, we were, this was quartermaster, you know. And I, I was thinking, before I went in, I was thinking about being in the infantry, you know. You know I, I wanted to. I wanted to, you know, if I was going, I wanted to fight, you know. And I didn't realize we were in quartermaster until after we got our, got our basic training. And then uh, uh, one day they carried us out to the, they carried us out to the, uh, oh, what is that, infiltration course. And, uh, Said, they said those bullets were, they had, had those machine guns, 30 cal machine guns uh, lined on that platform and so they were just 30, 30 inches above us, you know, crawling, crawling on our bellies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, of course, that, I was worried about uh, accidentally getting a little too high. Uh, during the time we did that, and the other fellas did that down there, uh, I never did hear of anybody there getting hurt, but I heard some other places where the fellas got, they got so nervous and everything, got excited and they jumped up and, and they got killed. Some of them got wounded, but most of them got killed because those those bullets coming so fast, you know. Uh, we heard about a place down in Georgia and in, in, in Alabama and then a uh, place uh, some place in Tennessee, it's three, four places. You know the news traveled, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, our you talking about you talking about uh, digging in, and they'd have those uh, those holes where that uh, filled with water. Well, it wouldn't be with water. It, they had it filled with water, but that it softened that soil. And they had some of those light charges in there, just like on the battlefield. And they and sometimes uh, 
there's a fellow, there's a fellow uh, up high where he could kind of watch, and they had that thing systematically arranged where that uh, uh, one, two fellows got got a little too got hit too hard, had to come to the hospital. But most of the time, they wouldn't set that off. They'd make, uh, they'd wait until you'd gone in there and maybe were crawling out, and uh, and you most of your body would be out of it. And they set that charge, you know, and all that mud and stuff would fly up. But uh, I only knew of three, two or three cases where, where that happened. But uh, but I got through mine. And all the fellas got through theirs all right. And uh, but that that's uh, that's a frightening thing. And I never did uh, I never did like guns uh, from a child up. I never did like guns until I got big enough to hunt, you know. And I was really fearful of them, and I didn't. I never did buy a gun until, until I got to be a man. I, I bought a shotgun to hunt with, and uh, I didn't buy a pistol until, until I came out of the army. Uh, just, just to have something to be around, have for protection, you know. And uh, but in it, and then about uh, uh, my wife gave me a twenty-two rifle. And I used to carry her on on a creek down here to help her learn how to shoot it. You know, we we'd shoot it uh, down. You know where this bridge is down here on the road mm -hmm. road. Mm -hmm. You know, it was pretty. Shoot into the bank. Yeah, right. And Mister 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 Hodges and he had a forty four on them big forty fours. And uh, when I worked for him after I came after I came out of service, and. Uh, uh, he uh, he used to carry me down there and, and his his stepson Paul. He used to carry him that carry us down there. We'd shoot that thing, Miley. You shoot that thing. To, <laughs> it, it, you you talking about you talking about kicking. But uh, uh, Paul and I used to go fishing. Then I used to go I used to go. Uh, uh, a bird hunt with Mr. Mr. Ho Mr. Hodges, and Paul uh, Paul and Mr. Hodges used to go out Grafton, Virginia, where they came from, and uh, they took this they took this hotel over uh, after after there's a man named Mr. J N J M Richards from uh, from uh, Florida. He was here when I came back, and and uh, and uh, he said, uh, Mrs. Uh, Moorhead said for me, said for me to give you a job if, if you wanted when you got back. Said said I wouldn't regret it, and I began working with him, and and in about a year, he sold out and uh, sold out to Mr. Uh, Mr. From, he was from he was from Virginia. One, my, one whose name I called a while ago. Uh, when did you go to France? You, you mentioned being in France. When when did your group go to France? Well, I, I'm 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 getting up to that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, mean. That's all right. Now you 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 stop me. <laughs> I, I'm I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, uh, about this, these 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 some of these things that come to me. You know, I tell them. I understand. And. Uh, but uh, but uh, well, I went on into the went on in, into the service and uh, and uh, after I stayed down at eleven those eleven months at uh, Camp Breckenridge Camp Breckenridge, uh, I uh, they shipped us out to Camp Ellis, Illinois. That's about thirty five. Forty miles from Springfield. I guess you know mm -hmm. where Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, we used to go up there and, and play at the Masonic Hall for the soldiers. The Masonic Hall opened that place up. They had upstairs. They had some facilities up there where they had a bar, and a dance hall, and everything. And they tried to be um, uh, they tried to be nice to the soldiers. And uh, they. They'd open up and let them come up there, and uh, and dance. And of course, they'd they'd make money off the liquor, you know. Uh, we, 
my, my special service, service officer, brother, uh, Lieutenant Harvey, he was from Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh. He, uh, well, of course, by me being married and a lot of boys, a lot of us were married, uh, we wouldn't go off to, you know, we wouldn't go to town like the single fellows did. Of course, the married, married fellows did too. But uh, there were about five or six fellows. Uh, I, I had a, I had a desire to be a jazz trumpet player before I went into service. And while I was in the in the CC camp before I went in, before I got out, I ordered me a trumpet from Montgomery Ward. And I, when I came home, I had it with me, you know. And there was a fellow here by the name of John Mop, and he was a deacon of our church. He worked for Mr. Bradford for several years, and uh, he was a trumpet player. Uh, back years ago, when he was a young man, I think two him and two three fellows were right here. One was a piano player, knee high, and another one, another one. Well, both of these fellows played piano. Uh, John 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 Garnett. Uh, was another fellow. They went with a, they went with a carnival or some kind of show. Uh, went off and followed this show for about a year, and then of course they came, they all came back home. But uh, uh, both of them could play pretty good piano, you know, uh, for fellows who just picked it up. One of them. And there's, there's a there's a boy down there that played drums. They they used to have a little old band years ago before we 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 even thought of you know, and um, one or two fellows one or two fellows played drums and and we just started out, you know, started out uh, before we left here. We used used to have they want they want us to play for a dance up there in the hall and we'd play for socials and things you know, but but but. Uh, when I left Camp Brackenridge, we went to Camp Ellis, and we stayed up there about six months. And uh, then they sent us to Camp Shiv, Mississippi. And we didn't know, we didn't know where we were going, or what we were going to do. But uh, in about two weeks, by the time we got organized, uh, they sent about nine hundred and 50 recruits from up New York down there. And uh, we stayed down there six months. Those fellows, those fellows uh, didn't know anything about military. And they, they, uh, we, we taught them how to, we taught them how to drill and all that. And we taught them uh, infantry tactics, you know, uh, we had some fellas uh, to come over and d go, go over judo with them, you know, and uh, and uh, but we taught them we taught them how to use use a bazooka, how to use a 50 cap machine gun, how to use 30 cap machine gun, and how to use that use that old three A three rifle, and how to uh, use a carbine. And uh, and uh, we also we also used to go out at one or two o'clock at night. Nobody knew this, you know, but the top brass. They'd blow that whistle. I had forty eight men under me, and and I, and they wouldn't even tell me. And sometimes uh, I used to I used to feel like what they said the, the preacher. Get riled up, he feel like cursing. <laughs> <laughs> did, and, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't no, mean to go, interrupt. No, go you. ahead. Did did, uh, did you go from there to France, or is that your last stop in the United States? No, Can't show no, no. We stayed down there those six months and got through with these fellows. You know, yeah. We we were training them for combat and all that, and then we came back to Camp Ellis, and stayed about six months over there up there, and then we got on a train and. And went because uh, we rode we rode the train uh, to both places, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and uh, but we rode the train from 
from Camp Ellis to New York. And we went to, uh, of course, at that time, we were on our way to POE. And, uh, and uh, we stayed up there. Uh, we stayed up there about, about four weeks, maybe about, about, about six weeks, getting our final training and, and getting, uh, getting shots and things. And, and uh, they kept going over us, you know, for any kind of illness that we might have, you know. And um, they kept checking us, you know. They made sure that when we left there, you know, that we were in ship shape. And then we, they taught us how to debark a ship if it was torpedoed or something, you know. And uh, I never did have no, I didn't have a lot of use for water, although I swam across that Bowling Green Barren River down there below the, below the railroad tr mm -hmm. trussel. I guess it, 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 it would be about, uh, I was just a boy, it'd be about a block, a block and a half, maybe two blocks down below. I swam across that river when I was 14 years old, but I said I'd never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> what I did, uh, on the other side, I learned how to swim. We'd have to walk across the trussel and go down the bank and go down about two blocks, a block and a half, block and, a half. and then you could... When the when the water was uh, in the summer during the summer pool, uh, you could get in the you could get in the get in the bank water to bank there, and it would just be up to up to your waist, and we would walk out, or oh, as far as from here to that wall there, and when it got up here, we'd swim back in. That's how I learned to swim, and we'd walk out again. We'd swim back into the bank, and so I'd been swimming about. Uh, about a month, and thought I was a pretty good swimmer. But, uh, but and on this other side, the, the good swimmer will stand because you could stand on a rock just about a half, uh, just about a fourth of a foot under the water, a great big rock there. It looked like he was made there. And uh, 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 fellas would, you could, you could jump off that rock. Well, the fellas said, I never did try it, but the fellas said, uh, the, the uh, it was about six feet deep at the at that rock, you know, and uh, and they had a swing. I uh, had a swing with a big ring in it, in it and, and a big rope, rope uh, steel cable up there. Those fellows put that, and that that tree, that tree was about uh, looked like he was about big around that door, and it was upon upon the hill, and it looked like well over a period of years. I didn't I, I didn't figure that out. Uh, until some time later, over a, pe uh, pe a period of years, the water would get up, you know, and uh, and they'd get up up to those roots, and it just washed that dirt away from those roots, and that root, that root, when, what they stood, the root they stood on, to 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 take that swing and dive out, you you'd have, you'd have thought uh, they made they made that hand make, although it was it, it was a, it was a root. And that thing was that big in, in the ground. And there was some fellas down there called uh, the cra uh, Crabtree Boys. They could, uh, it was about four of them, four brothers. And they were kind of small in stature. And they'd get on that thing, get on that root and reach up in and uh, unhook that uh, rein. And they'd, they'd go the full limit of that cable. And those fellas could do some of the most beautiful diving you ever saw. He'd go and he'd turn loose and he'd go and, and, and he could he could swim almost back to the bank. He wouldn't come up. He'd do that for uh, do that for uh, teasing some of the fellows playing around there on that rock. Sometimes he'd just come on back to the rock and pull one or two of them off that couldn't swim too good. <laughs> for a fellow that didn't care much for water, you spent a lot of time in it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Well see I wanted I wanted to learn to swim so yeah. that uh, I, I didn't know I was going to the army, but but I wanted to learn to swim. So if something came up, you know, and the fellows always help you. And I had a charmed life. Where were you when you when you heard the war was over? Uh, in uh, San Pedro, California, a teaching school, a navigation school. I had two years of that. And that's a funny thing. I taught 
I was an enlisted man as a quartermaster first class. And before I took the class over, a lieutenant commander was doing it. And here I was, the only enlisted man that ever taught this class, navigational class, to a group of officers. That's all I had was officers. All the way from Henson to four striped skippers. Uh, if you want to know what I mean by four striped skipper, that great folder there has my skipper of the Gamber Bay. And he has, uh, he was four striped captain. You might see the gold bars across his shoulder, right? Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you about camaraderie just a little bit. Like with your captain and stuff, and. Like, you know, you see all the movies and stuff that everyone makes of all this stuff. And then they have, like, the stern captain. And then, you know, what did you ever get? Was it a personable experience? Like, in other words, was it more like Marine training in training camp or something? Or boot camp? Or was it more like you see some of the movies, like, where you had a real, like, a personable person and, like, a real personality where you would, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, were, were your friends, I guess, is an easy way of putting it like with your captain and stuff like that? Because uh, there's a lot of trust, I guess, that goes along with all that stuff. Oh, yes. Uh, the funny thing, my skipper, this this one right here aboard, the, the carrier was, uh, I don't know why he did it, but he took a liking to me. I think it's because his name was Hugh and so was mine. <laughs> Only thing I could ever figure yeah. out. But one of my other duties was going around every morning to all the main offices where there was clocks. And I had to correct every one of them so they'd be right up to date when we'd use for navigation. It was very important to get the correct time. And all of our clocks were set with Greenwich England time. You probably heard of that. Mm -hmm. Greenwich Mean Time, it was really called. And that was my job each day is to go around and set these clocks. Well, I went to the captain's quarters to, to do that, and I knocked on the door, and he answered, and I said, uh, I wanted permission to set your clock up to date, Captain. He says, come in. And, of course, he didn't know it was me at first. And after I got in there, I had just been promoted a couple of days before that from my, uh, on my arm. I had two stripes and I wound up with three. I got a picture over there of it somewhere. Uh, isn't that it, Jesse? It was left of the TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? That's uh, was a, a picture of my, where I, Gained that extra stripe. No, that's not it. That's not. I don't know what that is. And the captain, it's around here someplace. Let's see this. I think it's this one right here. I think it's that one. No, that's has no red stripes on it. Did, did the captain survive the sinking of the ship? Yes, he was transferred off before that all happened, but the other skipper that uh, took his place was survived. Most of the crew survived, didn't they? Most of them. I think they lost... Jenny, what did you read that they lost... Uh, I think there was a crew of 1,100 and there was... 450 of them left afterwards. Seems like that's what it was. When, when did you leave the Navy? When did you get out? When was I discharged? January the 7th, 1947. So you ran a little over six years. Yeah. Or my, yeah. When, uh, Mm -hmm. When my it was my time to be discharged, 
there was just no way that they could handle all of them. It was getting out at the same time. And uh, I had to wait a few days to to get my final orders. And I was in uh, Long Beach, California for that, to, to be discharged. Well, let me ask you something. I, intent, I intentionally didn't tell you I was going to ask this. Do you remember your service number? Is that the right name for it? That's it. Uh, uh, 5663828296, I believe. While I was at uh, Hayes, Kansas, College Train Detachment, uh, uh, they put me, they made me a, a, a cadet captain and put me in charge of a, of a flight of about 40 men. And uh, one day I, I had a chance to talk to the sergeant. I said, I want you to tell me what I'm doing in charge of this group of men. I said, I've had no military training. I don't know anything about uh, about drill and, and a military bearing and, and all that. I said, what are you doing making me captain? He said, well, Goodwin, it's your age. It's your age. He said, you're older than most of these guys. <laughs> he said, they'll listen to an older person before they will a younger person. So I knew there was some reason that, that they picked me out. But anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. Where were you first uh, sent when you finished the training? Well, actually, they didn't have they didn't have a destination for us at that time, and they sent us back to San Antonio for a few weeks, uh, and and we took uh, some more classes, a little more. Actually, we just sort of goofing off till they found a place for us. Then they sent us back to Independence, Kansas, where we'd taken basic, and we stayed there for just a few weeks and then we got our orders to go to uh, Reno, Nevada, that was an overseas training unit. And uh, we knew when we heard the word Reno, we knew what was there. It was a OTU where they had C-46 planes and that's the kind of planes that they used in China, Burma, India. We knew when we were going to Reno that we wound up in, uh, in India because that's Everybody that went to Reno, that's where they wound up, was over in India and China. So you're going to be flying the hub. That's right. That's right. So we, we were sent to, uh, to Reno to have overseas training. And the first time we saw that plane, after we'd flown those training planes, it looked absolutely enormous. I thought there's no way in the world that that thing can get off the ground. I mean, it was huge, just a huge plane. It was... Uh, well, the cockpit, the, when you looked up at the cockpit, was nearly three stories higher off the ground because it sit at an angle mm -hmm. like that, you know. Was it, was it a, uh, were you flying transport planes? Or? Yes, it was transport. It was yeah. a transport plane. It was, uh, it was a great big, great big airplane. There was a C-47 that was quite common, but a C-46, they built about 3,100 of them, I guess, and they were built mainly to fly the hump. They were, they had two 2,000 horsepower engines, uh, one on each wing, and uh, they hauled just about the amount of cargo that you would get in a, in a freight car, H huge amount of cargo. And uh, they flew about uh, 250 miles an hour, and the ceiling was about 27,000 feet, it's about as high as he's supposed to fly. However, we came back one night a little higher than that, but that's about as high as it's supposed to fly. But it, it hauled a huge amount of cargo. It was a cargo plane. That's what we were trained to do, was to fly cargo from India uh, across Burma and uh, over into China. Did you were you did you land on a landing strip in China, or did sometimes you drop the cargo from? No, no, we always land on a landing strip. Security. We. Uh, we were in uh, in a place called uh, Chabua, C H A B U A, Chabua, India, and that was in the upper Assam Valley, sort of up in the northern part of India. It was real close to the Brahmaputra River, and 
in that valley up there, there were about six air bases, I guess. And all of these air bases had, had the same type of plane stationed there, I think, except one. I believe one had both C-46s and the cargo version of B-24. It was called a C-109. But it was just exactly like a, a B-24 Liberator bomber, except that it was built to haul freight, mainly to haul aviation fuel. And these bases that were over there, they, they had peculiar names. The ours was Chavua. Ours was probably the largest base because we hauled passengers in and out as well as freight. But another base was called Jorhat, J-O-R-H-A-T, and Sukerting, and Chittagong. Uh, yeah, I've forgotten the name of all of them. They're all named after a, a little village or community nearby, you know. So we would fly around the clock, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we'd fly supplies uh, out of India uh, across the, the Himalaya mountain range, which is the highest mountain range in the world. And we'd fly to, uh, to bases over in, in China. And the main base we went to, I guess, I guess 95 percent of my flights went into Kunming, Kunming, China. Took about average about four hours to fly over and four hours to fly back. However, that's not that's not really true because of the air con wind condition. That's where we encountered the jet stream for the first time, and uh, the jet stream sometimes had had wind up to 150 miles an hour. So if you happen to have a tailwind going over and you were flying east, you might fly over there in five hours. Uh oh, no, no, you fly over in three hours with the tailwind, and then if you encounter that same wind coming back, it might take five hours mm -hmm. to get back. Mm -hmm. And they lost all kind of planes because they couldn't realize what was keeping them from covering the ground down there. I mean, you know, if you've got a plane going 160 miles an hour, and you've got a wind that's blowing a hundred miles an hour, you're actually not covering but about 60 miles in an hour's time. So the wind, the weather had a whole lot to do with it. Were some of those bases uh, British bases or were they all American? No, they were all American. They were all American. Now, now the British base that I ran into, several going over there, the one at Karachi that we uh, we landed in, but when we first got to India, that was a British base. And uh, Calcutta was a British base, but uh, but they had American personnel there too, but we were using their base. By what route did you go to India? We flew uh, out of Miami, Florida, down through uh, South America to a place called uh, Natal, Natal, Brazil. Mm -hmm. And we took off from Natal and flew across the uh, ocean to a little speck out there in the ocean called Ascension, Ascension Island. And we landed on that island and refueled and then flew from there across to the British Gold Coast, a place called Accra, A-C-C-R-A. Then we flew across Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, uh, down across the Red Sea and finally over into India, Karachi, India. And uh, when I got over there, I happened to get a, see a globe. So I found Kentucky on the globe, put my finger on it, and then I went clear around over here to where we were in Karachi, and I said, halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a long way. That's a long way. Did you fly your own plane over there, or did, were you in a big plane? We you know, flew a know. brand new airplane over there just brand spanking new and uh, there were about seven of us that went over and the pilot's name was O'Toole and one of my classmates was named as a co-pilot and all of us got in our flying time going over because we would alternate flying co-pilot to get our flying time in because it'd been a good while since we'd flown see by the time you go through all the process of getting terminal leave and coming home and saying goodbye and winding around. You, you, first thing you know, months goes gone by. And uh, 
So we all got in flying time going over. But we took a brand new airplane over there. And as the funny thing is 7070 with the call numbers on it. And uh, the engines that had been put in that plane had been pickled. They had been stored in grease uh, till they were ready to use them. So they, they finally got them all cleaned up and mounted them on this plane and flew it down to Nashville. And that's the plane that we were assigned to fly over there again. So we left Nashville actually and flew on down to Miami and seemed like it every time we landed the next morning, the plane wouldn't check out. Those engines just just weren't quite tuned exactly the way they ought to be. So we piddled and fiddled with that plane all, all the way. They said we set an all-time record about how long it took us to get over there. But we weren't in a big hurry anyway. Yeah. 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 You said that, that same plane, that same plane, we were flying one night over the hump, and I heard a mayday call come in, and that mayday call was from seven zero seven zero, so the chances are it went down, probably from engine engine trouble maybe. Right, you got that. How many? Cru you said you flew around the clock. How many crews were assigned to the same plane? I assume that more than one crew. No, you, you never knew which plane you was gonna fly. Oh, and as you got over there, you, you flew whatever plane you were assigned to. And it was it was built actually for about a five-man crew, but they didn't need that many. They had a flight engineer on there that couldn't have done anything in the world. If you were up there flying, something happened to the plane. There's nothing in the world he could have done, except I believe that so-and-so, you know, you know, the jiggling pin or something. Yeah. But uh, so they decided to cut out, cut out the flight engineer and let's see, we had a radio operator and a pilot and a copilot. That's all it flew with. Just didn't have a navigator? No, no. I, the copilot co didn't have a navigator. After I got over there and stayed a little while, I flew one night with a man from California named Ed Holly. And, uh, and we liked each other right from the very beginning. And when we got back, he said, uh, Jack, how'd you like to team up with me and this radio operator? and let's fly as a team. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. He said, now, we'll split, we'll split the flying duties. He said, I'll fly over, and, and uh, you can do the navigating and the, the gears and the flaps and the, and the call in for landing instructions and all that. And he said, and then when we come back, you fly back, and I'll do that coming back. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. So that's what we did. Was there much, did you encounter many Japanese? Uh, not too planes? much, uh, not too much. I never did actually see a Japanese plane, and yet there were some in the area. They had a, a great big uh, bamboo pole, and on the end of it was a huge red ball, and they had that propped so that when they put it up in the air like that, that's called red ball alert. And that meant that that there was a chance that that base was going to be under attack, so they prepared for it. And uh, I never did see any. Though. I was I was fortunate. Never did see any have any enemy action at all. And yet, and yet the flying time that we were that area where we were, we were credited with combat hours. My my total combat flying hours were 600, 600 combat hours. It uh, that was the total flying time. I had just under a thousand hours flying time, but the uh, time flying over there, over the hump, was combat time. Were you still there when the when the war ended? Oh yeah, yeah I was. I was there. I was there when it ended in uh, in Europe, and things slowed down a little bit, but not much, because the war was still going on with Japan. Mm -hmm. So it was just business as usual. We all celebrated the E Day, but it was business as usual. They just kept right on flying supplies back and forth because uh, the Japanese still had to be defeated. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when did your service end? When did you? Well, I actually got the uh, orders to come home in December of '45. And I got home. I got home. I think Christmas Eve day. 
<laughs> Christmas, Christmas, Eve, yeah, Christmas Eve day, yeah. Bonnie met me in at Camp Atterbury and that ate one afternoon and we spent that night in Louisville and and I came home the next day and it was Christmas Eve day. And it was odd because I left in December and got home in December. So it was just almost a year to the day, the total overseas time that I had. What uh, what was your most memorable experience during your time in in the oh, service? Man, it was a lot. There <laughs> was a lot of them. I don't know really, really which was it. Uh, uh, Bonnie, Bonnie always likes to hear the story about the mules. We flew in one night from India, and Ed Holly and this radio operator and I flew in. And on the way over there, we encountered a, a terrific thunderstorm. I mean, it bounced us all over that sky. That was the most severe problem we had was the weather. And you hardly ever went out that there wasn't some turbulent weather and a lot of times there were some violent thunderstorms and you had to fly right through them because you flew it in the signed altitude. You couldn't decide that I'm going to climb up over this or I'm going to climb around it or something. You, you had to fly right through it because we flew at 15,500 feet going over. Well, Jarhat, another base, would be flying at 16,500, a thousand feet above us. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't dare leave our altitude and go up because you might get run into or you might run into somebody. So we had to stay at our assigned altitude as close as we could. Of course, with, with all the turbulence and everything, you bounced around a whole lot. And, and it was icing condition a lot. That that's would cause a, a engine to start cutting out and sputtering and and up completely. And you made the have to feather the the props on one engine and try to uh, hold out to it on the other. So that was I know we went through one one thunderstorm like that one night. It was it was just terrible. But anyway, that night that we got over there. We went through this terrific thunderstorm. But we finally broke out of it and, and uh, everything was smooth from there on over. And we landed in Kunming and went into operations and and uh, when we walked in this the sergeant there at operations said uh, said now Lieutenant don't be in a big hurry to uh, to get back. He said it's gonna be a little while Till we get your plane loaded, so you're going to have a load going back. So you got a surprise for you. And I thought, well, what now? Anyway, we piddled around for an hour or so, and the plane finally got ready. And we drove out there in a Jeep to the plane and looked up there, and it was about 12 mules in that plane loaded down through the cargo space. And what they did, they led the first mule in and turned with his head headed east, and they led the next mule in and turned him with his head headed west, and he alternated them all down to the plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, Holly said, oh man, Jack, said, we're going to have a load going back tonight. He said, now you from Kentucky, you know all about mules. <laughs> I, I said, yeah, I know all about mules, all right. I said, I know they're stubborn. <laughs> and and they had a, they had a, a trainer with them. Skinner, Mule Skinner, I think. Mm -hmm. The reason those mules were over there, back where we were stationed in uh, India, uh, in uh, Chebu, India, we were real close to a little place called Lido. Lido, India. And that's where the little narrow gauge railway came in, loaded with the trucks all crated up uh, to be driven across the Lido Burma Road. And they had all kind of rainfall over there, mud, mud, gap, mud, all kind of mud holes and everything, you know. So when they'd start a convoy across there, they'd take several mules with them. And when the trucks got bogged down, they'd use those mules to help pull the truck out of the mud hole. And they'd keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, until finally they got over to China. And then they'd have these mules over in China. Well, they didn't need them in China. They needed them back. They needed to mm -hmm. escort another convoy through. So we fell out of you this night to fly about 12 of them back. And I thought, 
if we run into that thunderstorm going back, that we ran into coming over here, there's no telling what those mules are doing. Get them all <laughs> upset with <laughs> yeah. we'll do. And, and if they get upset, I'll, I'll really get upset. And then I happen to think, now we'll be going back at a pretty good high altitude. And we'll be, we'll be on oxygen. And, and if you're not on oxygen, you really get sleepy and drowsy. And so I thought, maybe that'll affect those mules just like it would us if we weren't on oxygen. So anyway, it was my duty to fly back. And Holly was just kidding me all the time. Oh, Jack, you won't have to, oh, you won't have a trouble. So anyway, I was really glad to, to get back in and, and get them down on the ground. The, the supplies you were taking, I assume, were mostly for, ch for Chinese uh, the Chinese troops, yeah. right? But there were Americans at the bases where you took the. Yeah, but mostly there were Americans sort of in charge, but most all the labor was done by yeah. Chinese labor. I know you mentioned the sergeant, so I figured they were they were just. Uh, oh yeah. Americans there kind of to. Oh yeah, they, they oversaw they oversaw oversaw the whole operation, mm -hmm. but they had Chinese people that helped that helped them, and and they had learned a little English. They learned how to how to swap swap and barter and everything. I took uh, two cartons of cigarettes over with me one time because I knew you could get most anything you wanted to with, with a carton of cigarettes. And I think those cigarettes uh, in American money cost about 75 cents a carton. So that was about a dollar and a half I had. And uh, this little Chinese guy that was working down the little place, he said, you want trade? You want trade? And he pulled out several different things. Uh, Ronson cigarette lighter with a map of India and little stones and everything on it. And I said, no, no. He reached back in his pocket and he pulled out just the prettiest little nickel plated pearl handle, 25 automatic you ever saw. I mean, gorgeous, just about the size of the palm of your hand. I thought, boy, what a souvenir that'd be to take home. So I showed him one carton of cigarettes. So I pulled out one carton of cigarettes. <laughs> he traded me that 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 nickel plated pearl handle twenty five automatic with some, with some cartridges for those two cartridges. So when I got back the next day, I went out in the in the area next to where our tent was, and I picked out a pretty good sized tree, and I got back. Oh, I guess I got about ten yards away from it, something like that, and I always thought I was a pretty good shot. So I got it loaded up real good and, took, and shot at it. Didn't even touch it at all. Didn't even touch it. And I thought, well, what in the world is my So I got a little closer and it fired again. Didn't even touch the tree. I said, now I know I'm better shot at that because I qualified with an Army 45 and a carbine, carbine back in the States. So I broke that gun down and got the barrel and held it up to the light and looked through it, and you could see the curve in the, <laughs> see the curve. The handmade gun had a curve, and I said, it's a thousand wonders. I had blown my hand off. Or kill somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that gun didn't come back to the States. I choked it away. <laughs> they, had a rule, they had a rule over there that, uh, that from 10,000 feet, from 10,000 feet on up, Wherever you were flying, whatever else you were flying, you had you had to be on oxygen. And and at night, and most of the time we didn't put it on until the air temperature got up pretty close to ten thousand feet. We just lifted it off, and then we then we put it on. Yeah. And if you wanted to to talk to each other, you just unsnap it and say something, and then snap it back on. But at night there was a rule that when you were on the ground at night and fixed to make a flight, you turned on your oxygen at night put it on from the ground, from the ground up. That kept you uh, alert, alert and uh, wide awake. So you mm -hmm. used oxygen. They didn't have pressurized cabins. No, no, so. didn't. Matter of fact, we had a froze to death when we first got over here, even though it was hot as blazes on the ground. But we'd wear these fleece-lined, big, bulky fleece-lined boots and trousers and jacket and, and a helmet and everything fleece-lined. And because once you got on up to 15, 16, 17,000 feet, it's cold up there. And uh, then, lo and behold, somebody out of the goodness of their heart decided that what we really needed was electrically heated flying suits. 
So here they came in the issue paper, and they were nylon, and they were thin, and easy to wear, and they plugged in. They had shoes that you plugged the trousers into the shoe, and you plugged plug the uh, trousers into the, uh, the vest, and then they had gloves that you plugged them in, and then there was a cord that you plugged into the wall of the, of the plane. There was a little outlet there, and there was a wrist that switch on there. So you could sit there just like an electric blanket. You could turn it up just as hot as you <laughs> wanted or down in school. Boy, oh, we thought we were really living. That would be good. <laughs> but I got about all the flying I wanted I that one say. year. It got to be pretty much a drudge. Uh, you were allowed 12 hours from the time your wheels touched the ground back in India you were allowed 12 hours before they could call you out to fly again. And 12 hours could go by pretty fast. I remember one morning, we were coming from, how you get it? We were coming from China back to India, and we, uh, and the sun, the sun came up, and we're on, on top of the clouds, it's overcast, we're on top of the clouds, and the sun came up, and I'd be the most beautiful sight I ever saw, that sun on all those big billowy clouds. And you couldn't see a thing underneath at all. It was just on top of the clouds. And they were billowing, and, mm -hmm. and that sun started having rays through there. It was gorgeous. It felt like you were close to God. I went overseas in uh, September, October of 1944. So you, you, know, you, you weren't there then when the D-Day invasion took place? I wasn't place. there for the invasion. See, when you went in, the, the uh, you just went in at one of the ports, I guess, in France, didn't you? No, I went to England first. Did you? And uh, among other things, even though I was an infantry officer because of my training, Ed Benning, uh, in motors and transportation, I spent time uh, bringing motors, of course, with the men under my command from ports in Scotland where they was delivered from the United States, drove them across England to where they were then shipped on to France. And, uh, most of that was done, uh, or at least a part of it, at night. And that wasn't easy in England when they didn't want any lights. Still had the blackouts because they're still being bombed? Yeah. I, uh, that's another subject that uh, I must admit irritated me. How so? When we were in battle, we were relieved once by a, uh, or not relieved, a uh, unit adjoining us was relieved, and they sent in a British unit. And they came in in the morning, in their vehicles, with all the lights on, <laughs> which promptly brought in artillery fire from the Germans. So. They didn't rule, but follow the same rules that they expected you to follow. No, the opinion. British followed, uh, followed their own rules. They still do. You know that as a historian. They still do. Uh, they had their tea at 4 o'clock, almost regardless of what was going on around them. I'm talking about in battle. When, when you went into uh, to France, when did you go to France? When did I go to France? Mm -hmm. I went in. I went to France in uh, the first of December. Something, not that date, but now this is forty-four. Forty-four. So, did and you go in with a with a combat unit? I or? went in with a combat unit. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had been in that combat unit since uh, that division, since its organization, because I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina as a part of the cadre performing that uh, division. 
So I had been with that, and even when I was in England uh, and moving vehicles across England, I was doing it with personnel that was under me uh, in the 106th Division. Well, if, if you went into France in December of, of 44, you got in there just in time for the Battle of the Bulls. I'd been there about two, or my unit had been there about two weeks. And it might have been the latter part of November when we went over. We had a rough crossing across the channel. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, we were on these LSTs and also uh, had vehicles, vehicles, and it was so rough that uh, we had to lay off the port in France for a day or so before we could land, even, even after we had crossed the channel. But then from that, we went to uh, uh, a position in the Ardennes Forest, and uh, had been there approximately two weeks when the Battle of the Bowl started. And incidentally, it started uh, right in the vicinity of our unit and the unit on each side. Well, I was, I was just going to ask you that. I knew it, they came through the Ardennes, so I, I figured you were right in the middle of it when they... Well, uh, again, it... I have wondered it many times at the time and since, despite the fact that all of the so-called brass, or not so-called, all of the brass claims this isn't true. But I have wondered and still do if we didn't invite them. And the reason I say that, we had a green unit that had not, I was in a green unit, they had not seen any combat. We went in there with less than our rations. We went in there with our uh, identification on the bumpers of the vehicles and other identification that normally you would not have had. So the Germans were bound to know that we hadn't been there. And to make it even worse, the division and the other divisions on the uh, each side of us were spread out that way too. We had a 22-mile front for a division, which meant that you uh, had a few soldiers here. Well, not a few, two or three soldiers here, and then several yards away, some more, and so forth and so on. In other words, you were spread awfully thin. Very thin. Both the, what would be the normal area that a division would be responsible well, for? Well, when we went back in there and so forth, uh, it was about uh, a mile or two, about two miles. Okay. Two so, three miles. You worked very thin then. Oh, yeah. And, no and, doubt about it. Well, was your unit, did you just were forced back as part of the, and when the battle began? Uh huh? Yes, uh, the unit was attacked. There were, in the division, there were three infantry regiments. There were uh, four uh, artillery battalions, as well as other uh, supporting troops. Uh, such as uh, uh, ammunition and so forth and so on. And uh, I think it was on the second or the third day, third day but I, if I, my memory is correct, the second day of the battle that two of the regiments were captured leaving the regiment that I was in out there completely surrounded by Germans. Uh, we were in that position from about the 17th or 18th of December until we finally made contact with uh, American forces 
uh, that in rear, uh, in our rear at any rate, on Christmas Day, uh, 1944. During yeah. that time, uh, in the day daytime, we would try to move back as best we could and then at night form a, a defense unit and then move again the next day. Now what most people don't realize uh, that have never been there, if there is an extensive battle and you've got a real battle going on, the situation is fluid. Uh, as an example of what I was what I mean by that, uh, we were out there without any, uh, uh, with only the gasoline and the food and so forth that we had when the battle started. And of course, uh, we had not, or at least uh, there weren't any supplies and so forth being sent to us by a quartermaster department and so forth. So I had a, a warrant officer by the name of Amos Wright, great big fella, but very competent and so forth. And I sent him and two trucks and two drivers to try to get through the lines. Never, I really, I really didn't expect them to come back. They got through. Two days later, they came back with gasoline and food. Welcome, dude. Welcome, I'm sure. Well, I've read accounts and, and even seen it in movies where uh, Germans in uh, English-speaking Germans in American uniforms deceived people in during the Battle of the Bulge. Was any of that really happening, or to your knowledge, did you see any of it? Or hear any of it? I wish you hadn't asked that. <laughs> uh, we were holed up for the night, and I hadn't had any sleep for 36 hours. And I had found a place to go to sleep in this house that we were in. And I went to sleep. In the meantime, there was a German in an American Jeep that tried to come through our lines and they wounded him and captured him and brought him in to where we were. And the doctor there was trying to stop him from bleeding. And the uh, officer in charge there was trying to make him talk give his location and so forth and so on. And uh, he was dressed in an American uniform and in an American Jeep. He'd come in an American Jeep. So the doctor was still wanting to uh, stop him from bleeding. The lieutenant that was in charge wouldn't let him, or at least was telling, ordering him not to. And finally, they sent for me. I came downstairs. I was upstairs. I came downstairs. I saw his condition and so forth. And I guess I assumed that uh, because of uh, being in an American uniform, an American Jeep, that. Uh, He could speak English, but at any rate, I told the German interpreter there, I said, you tell that son of a bitch he either talks or dies, and I don't give a damn which. <laughs> I turned right around and went back upstairs and went to sleep. I never thought any more about that for two days, and it finally hit me about it and what had been done, and I got to checking and he was still with us as a prisoner. Did he talk? <laughs> that I don't know. But he did survive. 
he did survive. That I don't know whether he talked or not. But as I say, I wish you hadn't asked that. I don't, don't like that. You uh, but it occurred. That's interesting. I remember stuff. on one occasion when uh, you and I were talking when our wives were at a library conference, you told me about an incident you had during the Battle of the Bulge when a a shell hit the jeep you were riding in, if I remember correctly. Am I remembering that right? You remembered it correctly. Uh, because of the training I had at Benning and so forth, I was a staff officer in charge of transportation in the regiment. So uh, uh, I was in and out of the front lines, getting seeing that food was getting in and ammunition and so forth. So uh, I was moving around quite a bit in the Jeep and a lot of times in places that were being shelled. And uh, my Jeep driver and I were going somewhere, I don't know, don't remember what, and there was an 88 shell that hit the right front wheel of the Jeep and did not explode. That was a close call. <laughs> was that the, the, the or I'm sure that was the, the uh, worst incident, the closest call you had. It surely you didn't have one worse than that. Also, as a, in charge of the transportation, uh, uh, I was in charge of the motors and, and uh, the mechanics and so forth. And there was a vehicle that hit a landmine, land and uh, blocked the road. And I had orders. Uh, to get that vehicle, that road cleared and so forth. So I got a wrecker and so forth and went down there. The vehicle in front of me hit a landmine, cut the vehicle half and two, and of course you can figure what happened to the driver of that. We crossed that spot and the vehicle following me hit another one. So you did have some more close calls. <laughs> I'd be applying for a different position. Yeah. Because, I had one after that. When they started using this was uh, after we were back on the attack and so forth, and they started to, using the buzz bombs, what they call the buzz bombs, which mm -hmm. were actually uh, jet-powered bombs, but they were not finalized and so forth like now and they were sending them to England but every now and then they would be one that conk out before it got there and my jeep driver and I and it was snow on and so forth and we were going back to division headquarters to get see about some supplies and check on some supplies and ammunition and there was a big cut in the road and I told the Jeep driver to stop there that uh, I needed to relieve myself. And uh, he stopped and he was out changing, tightening chains on the vehicle and so forth. There was a church up on uh, our left on one side and there was troops over on the right hand side. And uh, I heard this buzz bomb cut off. And I said, Chris, it's coming in there. It came right in, hit that church, which was right over to our left and above us. And then uh, part of the shells and so forth hit in this unit that was over on the other side. And there was, as I recall, 30 or 40 casualties over there. We never got a scratch, all the debris and the con concussion went over us. You were in a low, kind of low spot? We it? were in a low, a very yeah. deep cut. 
Well, you had enough close call for several people. Yeah, you definitely win the close call battle so far. After the uh, after the Battle of the Bulls, did you go on? You're going into Germany. We went into Germany. Well, I have to back up a little bit. As we got back and joined the uh, American forces on on or about Christmas Day, and I think it was Christmas Day. Since two of the regiments of the division had been captured, there really wasn't any division anymore. So we were made the 4th Regiment of the 82nd Airborne Division. So from then on, we were on the attack. We had stopped the Germans, but were attacking back toward uh, the Rhine. And uh, my unit was with the 82nd Airborne in that attack until the bridge was captured at Remagen and we got to the Rhine River. And then they pulled our unit back because they had a lot of PWs then and so forth, pulled us back and we did prisoner of war duty from then until the time the war ended. Have any interesting experiences in that duty? <laughs> well, in one sense of the word, yes, and uh, another one that I amused me and also caused me trouble. Uh, we were doing uh, after they'd crossed the Rhine and so forth. We were doing duty and. Uh, checking prisoners and so forth and taking care of prisoners in a town on the Rhine River. And uh, suddenly we got orders to go to another in the southern part of the line and be relieved by the French. And uh, this same right and another officer or two and I were living in a a castle, to tell you the truth, overlooking the Rhine River. And uh, before we got out and so forth, had our stuff packed uh, and ready to go, the French came in and we're going to take over the same room. So I wasn't there. But uh, Wright told me when I did come back, he said there's a German, I mean French captain, and another officer and said they were going through our belongings hmm. and says I kicked that captain's ass all the way down those steps. I never thought any more about it, but uh, originally, I mean, uh, finally there was an order came down from headquarters. I'm talking about ICE headquarters. Want an explanation about that Frenchman. So it was an amusing incident, and then it caused some trouble later on. Was this an officer with the Free French, the Gaulle's troops? Yeah. 